Hey Rock Buddies, it's Papa. Hope you guys are doing well today. Today we're going to talk about schist, a metamorphic rock, S-C-H-I-S-T. We're going to learn about what schist is, how it forms, the different stages that sediments go through uh, via metamorphism to become schist, and we're going to talk about the different kinds of schist and what those different kinds tell us about the environment in which they form. So stay tuned, and of course, as usual, please subscribe. It helps me immensely, and I appreciate everyone who has subscribed. So schist, what is it? Here we go. Here's some schist, and the first thing that you will probably notice is it's very shiny. Schist is shiny, and the shininess is about mica, muscovite and biotite, and schist is metamorphic. Those three things kind of sum up schist. But where does schist come from? Well, let's just trace the whole entire history of schist. Here we go. Schist begins its existence as mud slash clay and silt. Here is a funky Crayola crayon drawing that I made to show you where mud, clay, slash silt comes from. Uh, the reason that I have to draw these is because there are a lot of copyright issues if you use someone else's image, but I'll explain this to you. On the left, you have the edge of the land where it comes down to the sea with these rivers that are emptying into the sea. So the sandy land is a kind of tannish color here. You'll also see uh, a barrier island located offshore that's the sand color. That's where we all go on our vacations uh, and all the high-rise condos are there. In between the land and the barrier island is what is called the sound, and that's where so much mud accumulates. If you're familiar with the intracoastal waterways that surround uh, most continents, those are the sound areas that are full of mud, clay, silt kind of uh, particles. How does it get there? Well, the rivers bring it down and dump it into the sound. You'll also notice that out from the uh, offshore from the barrier island, there's another area where mud can accumulate. This would be finer particle sizes than accumulate in the sound. And then out from where the mud is, you usually get a limey mud that has shell creatures shells in it and that's going to form limestone eventually. And mud also accumulates along the river courses whenever the rivers overflow. And here's a kind of a side view or cross section of that same idea with the uh, edge of the land on the left in red and the barrier island sticking up in red and then you've got the mud accumulating on each side of the barrier island. So the mud piles up in these places all over the earth and the weight of all the mud on top of the mud compresses it into a sedimentary rock called shale. So let's look at some examples of shale. Here's some Rome formation shale from the Cambrian period. Uh, and you'll notice that it's kind of a tannish and reddish color. That tells us three things. First of all, that it was chock full of iron, and that that iron was oxidized, which meant this shell spent some time above the water level before it was washed down into the sea. Why is it not dark like most shell? Well, because during Cambrian time, there was no plants on the land at all, so no organic material available to get into this Cambrian shell. Here's some Mississippian time period shell, and you can see that it's grayish and it has some fossil remains in it. Grayish means that it was deposited in water and did the iron in it did not have time to oxidize to red and the fossil helps us date the time period. I think this is called a Finistella fossil. During the Mississippian period shallow warm seas covered most of the earth. And finally we have some Pennsylvanian time period shell when the great Allegheny mountain building event created huge mountains that were eroding into a shallow foreland basin. Supercontinent Pangaea was coming together and also glaciers were forming and then melting and then forming again, causing the uh, mud from the ocean to rise up and cover the 
giant fern forests that developed all along the coastal plains, and that gave rise to layers of shale and coal. Most of the world's coal came to us during Pennsylvania time. This is siltstone from the western Blue Ridge province of Tennessee. It's similar to shale except its particle sizes are a little bit larger. This is called pigeon siltstone and it was deposited into a, a gigantic rift basin as the supercontinent Rodinia was rifting apart. So we know that mud and silt get pressed down by the weight of the materials on top of them and they become shale and siltstone. But how do these materials get metamorphosed into ultimately schist? Let's find out. In this picture, you can see a volcanic island chain on the right crashing into a continent on the left. Inside the red rectangle, the uh, volcanic island chain is pushing all the sediments between it and the continent up and mashing and crashing them as it pushes down on the edge of the continent. This causes uh, intense heat and pressure and that results in metamorphism. The shale on the edge of the continent gets mashed and metamorphosed into a new rock, a metamorphic rock. Slate. Next step in Mud's journey to schist is called slate. You know, with shale, you can scratch it with your thumbnail or for sure a nickel coin, but slate is much harder, and so it's harder to scratch. Remember how shiny that picture of schist was? Well, slate is not shiny, and that's one way to separate it from schist and other similar rocks. Also, slate usually breaks into these thin sheets. That's another good way to help identify it. Here's some sulfide-rich slate deposited in a western Blue Ridge rift basin as Rodinia supercontinent was rifting apart. The sulfur very likely came from volcanic activity associated with the rifting. Here we have phyllite, the next step in the metamorphism of slate. As metamorphic pressure increases and heat increases, it begins to form muscovite, in the rock and that muscovite begins to shine. In phyllite, you can't see the muscovite crystals yet, but they do impart the shininess. Here's some shiny phyllite from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the Copper Hill Formation. And I only took a picture of this rock, I did not take the rock. Here is a hunk of the mineral muscovite mica. This is what is going to be more and more evident as phyllite is metamorphosed further into schist. As you know, muscovite can separate into very thin layers and that's going to become more evident too uh, in the schist. Here is a piece of muscovite garnet schist from the Brevard Fault Zone. You can see the pieces of muscovite mica starting to form and flake off. These things flake off and fall into the streams. So if you're ever walking along and you see a stream that looks like it's full of silver and gold and pennies, then you know you're in a zone where there's a lot of this muscovite garnet schist. This garnet muscovite schist, also called button schist, is diagnostic of the Brevard Fault Zone, which runs all up um, from uh, Alabama up at least through Virginia. It's a zo zone in which major continental pieces slid against each other just like the San Andreas Fault in California. Here is a piece of biotite mica schist from the inner Piedmont of Georgia and it tells us that there was a little more iron and magnesium in the mud that deposited it than the muds that make the muscovite schist. Here we have some samples of graphitic or graphite rich schist from the western Blue Ridge province of Georgia. The graphite is pure carbon and it tells us that the organic matter that uh, accumulated with the mud that formed this schist was heavily metamorphosed to such an extent that it was all turned into graphite. When 
schist is subjected to super high temperatures and super high pressures in the presence of hydrothermal fluids. Those are hot volcanic fluids. It can turn into kyanite. Uh, and this is one of the ultimate uh, versions of schist. This is quartz muscovite kyanite schist from Mount Mitchell. Kyanite is very resistant to weathering and that's why Mount Mitchell sticks up and is the highest point east of the Mississippi River. This is a picture of felsic metatuff, but it shows you what happens to muscovite mica when it's exposed to volcanic activity in the presence of water. The white stuff is called sericite, and that's what this mica has been turned into. And you often find sericite in um, schist rocks. This lovely sample is called green schist and it is an example of reverse metamorphism. It started out as ocean crust or basalt lava flow that was shoved up on land during the Taconic Mountain Building event. And during that process in which water was involved, the mafic minerals like pyroxene were uh, reverse metamorphosed back to biotite and chlorite. Chlorite is a mineral similar to biotite and it imparts the green color to this uh, example of green schist. And now for my very favorite kind of schist. This is quartz, muscovite, sericite, pyrite schist. And this comes from a stratovolcano in an island arc. So all up and down the eastern coast of the United States, there are former island arcs that are now called Eastern Blue Ridge or Inner Piedmont zones that have this beautiful schist. This kind of schist results when a stratovolcano associated with an island arc explodes and blows out felsic tuff. That tuff settles down on the underwater flanks of the volcano and these volcanic vents flush through it uh, hot water and the hot water is laden with sulfur and iron and sometimes gold and sometimes lead and sometimes many other metals. The little dark spots are garnet and the red staining is pyrite staining. The white is sericite mica. Pyrite is a combination of iron and sulfur both produced by volcanic activity and these colors uh, in this beautiful schist are what the old time uh, gold miners looked for when they were searching for gold deposits. Here's a side view of some of this schist and you can see there's a lot of quartz, layers of quartz and layers of muscovite mixed together. So where are you most likely to find schist and other metamorphic rocks like slate and phyllite? Well, you're not going to find them in the Cumberland Plateau, also called the Allegheny Plateau and the Appalachian Plateau. And you're not likely going to find them in the Valley and Ridge province because these areas did not experience a lot of metamorphism. But you will find them in the Western Blue Ridge province uh, and the Piedmont province as well. These are the mountains, the ancient mountains and the ancient foothills that have been subjected to a lot of crashing and smashing, excuse me, and metamorphism. Okay, Rock Buddy, so that's it for Schist. I hope this was useful to you and educational. If so, please subscribe. And this is Papa saying, happy rock hunting to all my Rock Buddies. Pop out.